crew chief Scott Graves is leaving Joe Gibbs Racing and will be replaced immediately by Dave Rogers, the team announced Tuesday. Rogers has served as technical director for JGR's Xfinity operation. He will be the crew chief for Daniel Suarez the rest of the season. Rogers and Suarez worked together for five races in 2017, Suarez's rookie year, before Rogers took a personal leave of absence. Graves had been Suarez's crew chief since then. Rogers has 18 career cup wins while working with Kyle Busch, Denny Hamlin and Carl Edwards at JGR. Suarez was the only Joe Gibbs racing driver not to make the cup playoffs this season. He enters this weekend's race at Talladega Super Speedway 18th in points. Casey Kane announced Tuesday that he has not been medically cleared to compete the rest of the NASCAR season, effectively ending his NASCAR career. Kane, 38, had previously announced this would be his last full-time NASCAR season. Kane has missed the last five races because of dehydration issues and had hoped to be cleared after a test last week at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Instead, he was not. To say I'm disappointed after receiving the results that I was not medically cleared for the remainder of the season following a test session at Charlotte Motor Speedway last week is an understatement, Kane wrote in a tweet. It was my hope that everything would go well and I would be able to finish out the season strong in the know. 95 for Levine Family Racing Unfortunately, that's not the case, Kane stated in his tweet that he is, perfectly healthy, out of the race car and that doctors have not determined any underlying health problems. My body just can't handle extended periods of time in the race car and we weren't able to control the sweat ratio to keep me hydrated enough to prevent any permanent damage to my body, Kane wrote. Kane said he would return to racing sprint cars, which compete in much shorter races. He ended a note to fans by saying, See you all soon at the dirt tracks, and thank you for sticking with me over the years. Kane ends his NASCAR career with 18 cup wins and 529 starts. He won the Coca Cola 600 three times 2006, 08, and 12, and won the 2017 Brickyard 400 at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He also was the 2004 Cup Rookie of the Year. Regan Smith will again drive the No. 95 car this weekend at Talladega Super Speedway. Picked at twitter.com slash Jeff O'Quink, Casey Kane, at Casey Kane, October 9, 2018 I know what Casey Kane would love to finish the season. I appreciate that he's made a smart decision based on his doctor's advice to skip the remaining events. I feel lucky to have been teammates. It gave us the opportunity to become great friends. Dale Earnhardt Jr. at the Ledger, October 9, 2018 Whenever NASCAR returns to Talladega, the movie, Talladega Nights, is often brought up. What is your favorite racing movie and why? Nate Ryan, in the documentary category, it's, Cinna. The chronicle of one of Formula One's most extraordinary talents and personalities is so emotionally gripping, you can be captivated without knowing anything about racing. In feature films, it's Le Mans because Steve McQueen, and winning because Paul Newman. Dustin Long, winning. The 1969 movie, which starred Paul Newman, Robert Wagner and Joanne Woodward, is a classic. A close second for me is Senna, the powerful 2010 documentary of Ayrton Senna. Daniel McFadden, the cinematic masterpiece that is Days of Thunder, okay, masterpiece may be a strong word, but it's the best depiction you could ask for of NASCAR in cinema, and I try to watch it every year before the Daytona 500. It's not too far over the top and the on-screen racing is gripping and fun. Even though it wasn't a breakout hit at the box office, Days of Thunder, undoubtedly played a factor in the rise of NASCAR's popularity heading into the 1990s. The sport could use another film like it right now and not a farce like Talladega Nights, Dan Beaver, Greased Lightning. It was not only a good racing movie but an exceptional biopic of Wendell Scott and an inspirational underdog story. What is your most memorable Talladega moment? 
Nate Ryan, there are too many surreal episodes to choose just one, but five stand out from those covered in person, the April 6, 2003 race in which Dale Earnhardt Jr. rebounded with a damaged car on a controversial pass for the lead below the yellow line. Everyone thinks of multi-car crashes at Talladega, but Elliott Sadler's never-ending tumble down the back stretch in the Sept. 28, 2003 race still registers. Jeff Gordon's winning celebration on April 25, 2004, being met by a few thousand beer cans hurled by angry masses showing their displeasure with a yellow flag that ended Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s bid at a win, and virtually created the overtime rules. The wicked airborne crash of Carl Edwards into the front stretch catch fence during the final lap on April 26, 2009, injuring several fans as Brad Keselowski scored his first cup victory with the underdog James Finchneen. The massive cloud of dirt and dust that erupted in Turn 4 on October 7, 2012 when a block by Tony Stewart in the last turn helped trigger a 25-car pileup in left turn Hart with a concussion that sidelined him for two races. Dustin Long, so many. Here are a few I've covered in person, Dale Earnhardt's final cup win in October 2000. He went from 18th to 1st in the final five laps to win in one of the most riveting charges to the checkered flag that I've witnessed. The April 2004 race when fans littered the track after Jeff Gordon won. Gordon and Dale Earnhardt Jr. were side by side when the final caution came out. Gordon was declared the leader and won when the race when it could not be resumed before the checkered. The October 2006 race. Dale Earnhardt Jr. led the last lap with Jimmy Johnson and Brian Vickers trailing. Johnson made a move to get under Earnhardt and Vickers followed. Vickers hooked Johnson, turning Johnson's car into Earnhardt's car, wrecking both. Vickers scored his first career cup win. The October 2008 race where Regan Smith took the checkered flag first but Tony Stewart was given the win by NASCAR because it stated that Smith illegally passed Stewart by going below the yellow line coming to the finish. The April 2009 finish where Carl Edwards' car flew into the fence in his last lap duel with Brad Keselowski, who scored his first cup win and it did for car owner James Finch. Daniel McFadden, it may not be my most memorable moment, but it's what popped in my head. A year before his dramatic final cup win, Dale Earnhardt showed off his magic in the 1999 IROC race at Talladega. Coming to the checkered flag in second place, Earnhardt shot to the outside of Rusty Wallace in the trioval. He went as far wide as you possibly could and beat Wallace to the line without any help. Fun fact, all three of his 1999 IROC wins came on a last lap pass. Dan Beaver, Bobby Allison's watershed 1987 accident that forever changed racing on the super speedways. Who wins a race first, Kyle Larson, Jimmy Johnson, Denny Hamlin or Eric Almirola? Nate Ryan, even after his week showing at Dover International Speedway, Kyle Larson remains too talented to stay winless, and his up-and-down season could foreshadow a surprise win at Talladega or a redemptive victory at Kansas Speedway. Dustin Long, Denny Hamlin at Marnesville, Daniel McFadden, Eric Almirola. He's fed up with coming up short this year and barring being involved in a wreck I expect to see him flex his restrictor plate muscles this weekend. Dan Beaver, Kyle Larson wins at Kansas in two weeks. But if he can't pull it off, then Denny Hamlin grabs the checkers at Marnesville. Stuart Haas Racing had an eventful Sunday at Dover, but what made it eventful kept it from being great. At one point in the middle of the 404-lap race all four SHR cars were at the front of the field, with Kevin Harvick leading Eric Almirola, Clint Bowyer and Kurt Busch. Harvick led 286 laps but a pit road miscue forced him to pit twice under green late. He finished 6th. Almirola led 64 laps and looked poised for his first win with the team until Bowyer crashed with less than 10 laps to go. On the ensuing restart, Almirola caused a multi-car wreck. He finished 13th, Bush, the only unscathed SHR driver, finished 5th. 
SHR led 351 of 404 laps in failing to win. On NASCAR America, Jeff Burton and Kyle Petty discussed SHR's path through the rest of round of 12, specifically with Harvick's team on pit road. They've got to get this fixed, Burton said. It's not an easy fix. Dot dot dot. As these playoffs move on, these type of things will keep you from winning a championship. Because they ran so well, they actually earned the most amount of points. Dot dot dot. That's what running well can do for you today, Petty observed that all four SHR cars were of championship caliber Sunday. All four teams performed at that level, Petty said. All four drivers performed at that level. But Kevin Harvick, once again, threw down notice yesterday, I think, to a lot of people to say, hey, the first round we were here. But we come to play ball now, watch the above video for more. Sunday's Cup race at Dover saw two instances of rear ball joint failures on cars. The first occurred on Jimmy Johnson's No. 48 Chevrolet during the pace laps and resulted in Johnson going to the garage for repairs before the green flag. He finished 36, 17 laps off the lead. The second failure happened to Clint Bowyer's No. 14 Ford and resulted in him crashing with less than 10 laps to go. NASCAR America's Marty Snyder reported Monday that the incidents have caused concern in the NASCAR community over the rare failures. That's a NASCAR-mandated part all the teams buy from one vendor, Snyder said. There is concern both those pieces have been sent to metallurgists that there might be a bad batch of ball joints. So throughout the NASCAR community, all those pieces are being changed for Talladega and moving forward, watch the above video for more from Marty Snyder on Sunday's Cup Race. Scott Miller, NASCAR's Senior Vice President of Competition, discussed the ball joint failures Monday on Sirius XM NASCAR Radio's The Morning Drive, It was a very strange failure, something that we, me as a racer and everybody in the garage area, it's not a part that would typically fail, Miller said. Very strange, we looked at the parts and stuff with the team. Going to get a full metallurgy report and see if there was potentially a bad batch of material or something that led to it because it's not a typical failure at all, Todd Gordon, crew chief for Joey Logano, also addressed the part issue on the morning drive, saying it really had me scratching my head. I know the Hendrick guys will be looking at it, and I'm sure the parts supplier will have an intent view on it because that's not something we all play in, Gordon said. That's a common part across the industry. I'd say every team is looking at that and trying to understand what happened and make sure we're not all vulnerable, too, because if Jimmy makes it through the round last week at the Roval, that's almost a championship run-ender for any team still in the playoffs. Something that we'll all have to understand. That's a really odd part to break. I can't ever remember a ball joint failing especially on a pace lap like that. One when it hits the wall is one thing, but to be under normal racing scenarios and have one break, or in that case under caution. From what I understand, I don't think it was a different part than what they, what they had practiced with. Really odd timing with that one.